second cousins of our pies. So usually, but not always, your tarts are going to be open faced. We're going to use a different dough. You made the short dough last time. The dough is going to be a little different. It's going to be sturdier. It's meant to stand alone. So when you bake your tarts in the tart tins, you don't serve it in the tart tin like you do your pies. You're going to take it out so your, your dough needs to be somewhat sturdy. So tell me about the dough that you made last time. What was your method? Yeah, you want to look at it as a creaming method. The important thing here is that you don't cream until light and fluffy. If that happens, you get a real crumbly dough. But you're basically following the creaming method. You're blending the fat and the sugar together. You're adding the eggs, you're adding the dry, right? Okay. So that dough keeps a lot longer than pie dough. It's got a lot of sugar in it. It's got a lot of butter, but the sugar's gonna prevent funny stuff from growing. I'm like pie dough. You store pie dough in the fridge for about three days and it starts to oxidize and look a little weird. So um, this, this lasts a long time in the fridge. So you want to think of tarts as components, where you've got some kind of a pastry crust and then some kind of a filling, various fillings. And if you were working in a restaurant or a bakery, you would make a, a big load of uh, tart dough and you'd store it in the fridge and pull it out as you needed it. You could easily keep it a week longer in your fridge. So looking at that mixing method, the way you mixed it, tell me, do you think it's going to be flaky or not? No, why? Why not? Yeah, you don't have the hunks of fat to give you big layers like in pie dough. So don't expect this to be um, flaky. It's going to be somewhat tender because of all the fat and all the sugar in it. It's, it's more like a cookie. In fact, one use for this dough, leftover dough, is cookies. You see uh, the sandwich cookies, the jam in between. You see that a lot with this tart dough. So the dough, when you take it out of the fridge, we pull it out, it's going to be pretty darn firm because it's all butter for the fat. So I pulled it out so it can soften just a little bit for you. <laughs> and the nice thing about this dough is that you can re-roll it. So look at the ingredients and look at your mixing method. Compare that to pie dough. So tell me, why do you think you can re-roll this without excessive toughening compared to pie dough? There's not much gluten development to start with, and why is it that there's not much gluten development? What's going on in that dough? Okay, there's fat. If you look at the percentage, it's actually about the same amount of fat as in pie dough. But how is that fat worked in? It's worked in differently so that most of that flour is then coated with fat. So when you add the flour to that egg, butter, sugar mixture, it really coats it. So you don't have lots of exposed flour. What else about that formula would make it tender? Sugar. Lots of sugar. Lots of sugar. We also have eggs, and the egg yolks are tenderizers. So you've got tenderizing ingredients going on in here. So this is a dough that you can roll and re-roll. So usually you, you want to re-roll your scraps with fresh dough. And you don't have excessive toughening. So the uh, crust that we're using is just kind of an all-purpose crust. Our book calls it short dough, it also goes by the um, name sugar dough, and pot sucre. So when you see the term pot, this is pot, not pate. Pot means paste, means pastry, it means dough. Sucre, what do you think that means? Sugar. Sugar, okay. So here you have your sugar dough. So oftentimes you'll see it called pot sucre. You know, um, Textbook. Our book calls it sugar dough. So what we're going to make with this dough are going to be tarts, which are going to be the large size, and tartlets, which are the smaller size. So when you're rolling your, your dough, you have a big piece of dough. Scale off a piece of dough for your tart, and what you want to figure is you want to have about an ounce of dough per inch of tart diameter. So this is a, like a nine and a half inch and then we've got an 11 inch. So you, bare minimum, you want to start with an ounce of dough per inch of pan. So we're going to be making these nine and a half inch tarts today. But I want you to start with, give yourself a pound of dough to start with so that it's really comfortable for you. You're going to work it a little bit into a circle. You're going to roll, turn, roll, turn, roll, turn. Take 
make it large enough to fit in here, so you want to have excess dough. And it's going to be a lot harder to put your dough in here than in a pie pan. And the reason is these top edges, I'm going to pass this around, these top edges are somewhat sharp. So as soon as your dough touches, it tends to cut off. But this dough is easily patched. So if that happens, we can easily patch it. So if you notice those tart tins that are removed from the bottom, so you can take them out of the tin to serve it, be really sure that you get the tart off of that metal bottom. I can't tell you how many bottoms I lost in my bakery from the tarts going out with the bottoms on. Yeah, so you know, don't forget to take the, the bottom part of your pan on. But feel the top of that. It's pretty darn sharp. It'll cut off your dough. So when you ease your dough in, you have the rolling pin technique where you roll up your dough and you unroll it and you have folding the dough, easing it in technique. You're going to be a little more successful at folding the dough and easing it in than doing the rolling pin. And then you take your dough, just like your pie dough, from the outside in, ease it in so that you see the distinct shape of your tart. You don't want it to be rounded because then you've got shrinkage going on. So you want to ease your dough in, fit it in, and this normally does not get a crimped edge. It just gets cut off to the top of the tart tin. And then you've got the fluted side. So to press off the dough on top, you can just take your hands and just touch the dough to the top. It'll break right off. You can take your rolling pin and roll it across the top. After you roll, you need to chill. So you want to think of it as just like a pie dough, roll, chill. We're going to relax the loop. We're going to firm it up so that it bakes with uh, less shrinkage. So baking temp, wild guess, baking temp. Any guesses? Little low. Yeah. So 375. 400 is your baking range. I find 400 sometimes a little hot. So why are we not baking at 425 or 450 like pie dough? Why will it burn? What's in there? What else? Sugar. Butter. Egg yolk. Okay, so at this point in your student career, you need to start making those connections. You need to look at this dough, you need to think about it, and you need to think about what the temperature range should be. So start connecting all those dots, okay? So that's going to be um, our baking range. We will do some blind baking today, and we're going to do some um, filling goes right in. Okay, so think of these tarts as components. So you've got the pastry. It could be a plain sugar dough. It could be a chocolate dough. It could be a nut dough. Linzer dough is a spicy nut dough with ground almonds or ground hazelnuts in it. It could be any number of types of dough. So you want to think of that part as being one of your components. And then think of fillings, and then think of toppings. So some real common fillings for tarts would be, name me some, what are we doing today? Pastry cream. We're making a fresh fruit tart. So the fresh fruit tart, the pastry is blind baked. When it's cool, you fill it with pastry cream. You made the pastry cream already. You pipe in your pastry cream, and then you arrange fresh fruit on top. That's very classic, traditional, French-style tart. Uh, I ordered in um, strawberries, kiwis, and blueberries, so we'll do something fun with it. I don't want you to start cutting up your fruit until you talk to me and draw me a little diagram of what you want your tart to look like. So a fresh fruit tart should look abundant should look abundant. You don't want to have little thin pieces of strawberry that dry out and wrinkle up in an hour. Okay? And you don't want to have a really flat looking tart. You want it to have some dimension to it. So instead of thin slices of strawberry, maybe you do strawberry halves, for example. Okay, you do a little mound of blueberries instead of two little blueberries. So I want you to draw me a, just kind of an example of what you think your fruit tart should look like before you start cutting up a bunch of fruit. Okay, so fruit tart, pastry cream, fresh fruit on top. We're going to top it with apricot glaze or nacage. The apricot glaze we use is a commercial product. Comes in the big yellow bucket down there. And um, the dilution rate is um, two parts of, what is it? Two parts of, is it water? Or is it the... Apricot. I said it would be it's on your lab. Two apricot, one water. Two to one. Okay, two apricot, one water. It's on your lab. The amount that you use. 
There might be some diluted clays up there already in a container. I'm pretty sure there is. So we're going to look for that first. Okay. When you use vapor pot glaze, it does need to come up to a simmer. This particular brand needs to come up to a simmer. You want to whisk it to make sure the water in the uh, apricot glaze is all mixed so you don't have little lumps of the glaze. And then this gets brushed on while it's hot with a pastry brush. The purpose of that glaze, what do you think the purpose of? Why would you glaze a fruit tart? Okay, so you're going to seal it. You're going to seal it from the air so that your fruit doesn't dry out if it's cut and exposed so it doesn't brown. Some fruits will brown. Okay, so this will keep it from browning. So you're going to seal it. So what else? Yeah, it makes it shiny, glossy, pretty. So it's like a little bit of makeup. And then the other thing is this acts as glue, so it holds all your fruit together. So if you're making a large fruit tart like this and you didn't glaze it, once you start cutting your pieces, your fruit kind of slides off the pastry cream. So if you glaze it, your fruit's going to stay intact. Uh, if you were working in a restaurant and you were serving fruit tarts, no doubt you would serve individual fruit tarts rather than trying to cut because most likely your last fruit tart is going to look kind of ugly. Your last piece is kind of ugly because the fruit slides. So this is a better way to go on that. So it acts as glue. It glues all your fruit together. Okay, so pastry cream. That's, you know, real traditional filling. So what else? What else might you put in a tart? Lemon curd or lemon filling. What else? You could do savory tarts, but you would not use the short dough that we have. You would use what is called pot brise, which is going to be um, a dough. It doesn't have the sugar in it necessarily, and the fats usually cut in. So let's go back to sweets. We're just doing sweet today, but absolutely savory tarts. You know, tomato tart, goat cheese, all that. What else? What? Ranch pan. Ranch pan. What's ranch pan? French pan is an almond paste mixture. It's almond paste, some eggs, a little bit of flour, some sugar. Okay, um, it, it's kind of like our bear cloth filling. The bear cloth filling has some crumbs and other stuff in it. French pan. This is a, a real common filling that you pair with fruit. So the tart today, the traditional, uh, this is such a classic tart, is the pear French pan tart. But we have apples left from our apple pie, so we're going to do an apple French pan tart because I didn't want to order any fruit that we didn't really need. So this is paired with fruit. Um, cherries and frangipan is a real classic combination. The pears, the apples, lots of different things with frangipan. So the way you use the frangipan is it needs to be baked. Once it's baked, it has the consistency and the texture of almost like an almond paste pound cake. So we're going to bake this with the fruit in it. You can also bake your pastry with frangipan, and then when that cools down, you can put fresh strawberries on top and glaze those. So it doesn't have to have necessarily fruit baked with it. Another really nice combination is uh, baked frangipan. When that cools down, you can put caramel and um, mixed nut mixture on top of that. That's really good. Okay, so frangipan. I'm sorry, what was frangipan again? What is frangipan? What is it? It's, um, it's almond paste, eggs, sugar, and usually there's a little bit of flour. When it's baked, it's like an almond paste pound cake in texture. Kind of similar to our, to our bear claw filling. Yeah. We did that braided coffee cake last time with a branch pan filling. Yeah. That was it. Then another filling might be ganache. You can bake ganache or you can put it into a hard baked shell. Top it with some whipped cream or some chocolate mousse. You have a really rich um, tart. Caramel or caramel nuts. Lots of different things. Mousses, chocolate mousse, fruit mousses. So here's the deal with tarts. If you were working in a restaurant where you're producing various tarts or a bakery, you would have your components on hand. You would go into your walk-in and you would find your dough. You'd find a bucket of French pan. You'd probably have a container of lemon curd hanging around. That keeps weak as long as you don't get it dirty. You'd always have ganache on hand. You might have caramel on hand. Think of this as components. You go in, you whip out what you have, you throw together a tart. Ta -da. So it's not like you look for specific tart recipes. Okay, I want you to think of it as components like this. So we're doing three of the real classic today. The pear, almond, the um, lemon that we're going to top with meringue, and we're doing the, the fresh fruit tart.
<laughs> so I want to go over um, each of those tarts with you because we need to talk about um, how to make that meringue also. So pull out your lab. So I'm going to make some changes. So I want you to take notes on your lab for these changes. So we're going to start with the uh, pear on tart. There's a picture up here of that one. If you went to a European style baker, you would, you would see this. So you're going to use the large tart for that. You're going to use the nine and a half inch tart for that. And you're going to um, <clears throat> line this with your pastry and then you want to chill it. And um, so tell me, are you going to dock this? No, why? Not the air. Gloria? Okay. What? Where it comes like a part of Won't come apart. Why would you not cut off this? What are you putting in this? You're putting in a filling. You're putting in a filling. And then you're going to be baking it. So if you have holes in here, where's that filling going to go? Yeah. So you're going to dock if you blind bake something that um, is going to be completely baked and then if you put a filling in, it, you know, it's not going to wreck. So, so you, you're not going to dock this. So traditionally you would use pear halves and the pear halves uh, might be poached if they're a little firm and then they would be cut. You can see in that photo there, huge pear halves. You slice it this way, you put it on your bed of French pan and then you bake it. We're going to substitute apples. So what I want you to do with your apple, you probably take your Maybe three apples. Apples are down. I hope they're still there. Are there apples behind you, Tina? Okay. Yeah. Peel for the apples and then slice your apples so that out of one half, you're going to get probably uh, six pieces out of one half. Okay, so 12 slices out of the whole apple. You don't want it too thin because this is going to be about a 35 minute bake time to get the French pan done. So if the apples are too thin, and then they're going to end up being mush. I want you to quickly saute those apples with a little bit of butter. So a little bit of butter, what's that? I don't know, maybe a tablespoon. Don't measure it, just put you know, some butter in the bottom of your saute pan. Throw the apples in, saute them a bit. Take a tablespoon of sugar, kind of glaze them. Just take the crunch out. Just take the crunch out. So maybe you're sauteing them for three minutes, four minutes. And then you're going to cool them down. You're going to scale out the frangipan. If the frangipan is somewhat firm, it's better to pipe it in your prepared pastry. If it's soft, then you can spread it. I should have to find a frangipan for this group. We pull it. We're going to soften it. We're going to pull it out. So you spread your frangipan in, and then you're going to arrange the apples so that they're shingled on your frangipan. So when we say shingled, this is what we mean. They overlap. Okay. What's up? Those are apple slices. And then um, shingle this way around so the whole surface of the French pan is covered with apple. Apple slices. Okay, and then double pan because these bottoms are really thin. And if you don't double pan, then we're going to over overbake the bottom. Keep in mind there's a lot of sugar in this. So there's your double pan. Into the oven. Probably looking at 30, maybe 35 minutes. Test for doneness. The pastry should look golden. The frangipan should feel like a cake. You haven't done cakes, of, but, yet, but you've done muffins. So it should have some spring to it. And the apple should feel tender. Bring it out, leave it in the pan, let it cool. We're going to glaze it with um, apricot glaze is our final uh, touch to it to keep the apples from drying out. And this does need to be unmolded. This should be the first tart that you do because it takes a while to cool down so that we can unmold it. The tart is fragile when it's hot. So um, you want to have at least an hour cool down time possible before we unmold it. Then after you unmold it, we'll put it on uh, some gold boards. We're going to sell some of these. We'll sample and then we're going to sell. So then you're going to glaze the top if you want to put some um, Perfect. Is that oh perfect? This is when it was like, oh right. Let's put it on that rack. Okay, here is uh, diluted apricot glaze. So there should be enough for the class. You don't have to dilute any. And we're gonna pull out your French pan so you can soften. So then a light brushing of the apricot glaze, and if you want to press some crushed toasted almonds along the border, you can. We have those in the uh, rack there. 
one is going to be now the apple almond tart. Lemon meringue tart. We made the lemon filling last time. That's in there. We are going to use what we call the modern tart rings. So a very traditional tartlet is going to look like this. Or this. They come in various sizes. We have like half inch size, minis. They're all the way up here. So these are the traditional look. This is the modern look. So I'm going to have you do the lemon meringue tarts with these rings. And I'm going to have you do the fruit tartlets with these. Just so you get the hang of both of them. So when you roll your dough out, these are a little harder to work with. When you roll your dough out, you need to have a half sheet pan with parchment on it with your rings on it. And then you're going to fill the dough, put the dough in your rings right on the sheet pan. Because if you try to put the dough in the ring on your table and then pick it up and move it, the dough often falls out. Okay. Um, so these get blind baked. And we're going to blind bake them until they're, until they're mostly done, but they don't have to be completely done. So they will be back in the oven probably another 15 minutes or so. Don't dock these because we are putting that lemon filling in, but do weight them down with pieces of parchment and beets for your blind bake. We're going to blind bake in the convection oven. It does a better job than the, the deck oven. Um, so after you blind bake, then you're going to put the lemon filling in. The easiest way to put it in, because it's kind of loose, would be to use a scoop, a portion control scoop. Put the lemon filling in, it goes in the oven, and then we'll go in the deck oven. You want to think of the lemon filling as a custard, so it can't take a real high heat. So if you're, um, if you see some curdling going on, then your your heat's a little hot. <clears throat> so we're going to bake. 350 would be good for your lemon filling. Uh, the lemon filling will. Um, Feel firm when it's done. It'll feel firm when it's done. If you put a paring knife in the center, pull that out, you might get a little bit of curd on it, but it will be basically dry. It's not going to look, you know, wet, wet and custardy. And then we're going to top these with meringue. So the last meringue we made was what kind of meringue? What did we call that last one? Last time? French meringue. Okay, today we're doing a Swiss meringue. The formula's down at the bottom there. This, honestly, this is the easiest meringue to make. So, Swiss meringue. Here's how you do your Swiss meringue. You want to have clean whites, and we have whites. Don't separate eggs for the, for the meringue. We've got whites. We've got a lot of whites. So, you have to put your whites and the sugar and the cream of tartar in your mixer bowl. And then you're going to put that over Bambari. You're going to whisk it until this mixture hits about 120. You'll see various ranges. You'll see 120 to 140 in different textbooks. At 120, your sugar will be completely dissolved. And that's the, the key thing here. You've got to get that sugar completely dissolved. So keep your meringue or your uh, egg whites and sugar moving with a whisk because it will try to cook on the sides. You don't want to have boiling water underneath because you will cook your whites. So just barely simmering water. It will take you a few minutes to get to the right temp. Pull it off the heat. Put your mixer bowl on the mixer. Whip on medium to medium, slightly medium high, probably number six on these mixers. Whip until you get almost to a stiff peak stage. It'll take you a couple minutes. And then we're going to pipe this. <laughs> and um, this look on the lab is with a plain tip. So you can do that. If you want to do something with a star tip, something else, we can do that too. Because you're going to pipe the meringue on, and then we're going back in the oven to brown the meringue. Or if you want to have a lot of fun, we can blowtorch the meringue. This meringue is considered a cooked meringue. So you don't have to cook it in the oven, you just blowtorch it. Um, not quite too big. Not quite so large, but go inside. You want to stay inside the line. Okay. Uh, okay, questions on that? On the Swiss meringue? Swiss meringue can be a base for buttercream. It's used for a topping. It can be a base for a mousse. Fold something in and you know, get a mousse out of it. So Swiss meringue, you need to know how to make Swiss meringue. You need to master Swiss meringue. It's easy. My, my dog makes Swiss meringue. It's very easy. Base for what? 
Oh, for a lot of things, for Bavarian cream, for a mousse. So I don't want you to get stuck on thinking the only thing you do with that Swiss meringue is top and then tart. It makes an awesome mousse. Oh my god. Yeah. I think we should find the blood torch. I could do a demo today. <laughs> oh, uh oh. Okay. And then the uh, fresh fruit tartlet is going to be made in these. Okay. So these are going to be um, blind baked. Also, these you can dock, and it'll help with the blistering. Put a piece of parchment and some beans in convection oven again. These are going to be completely baked, so partway through you take the weights out and then you finish baking. You have to cool these down before you fill them with pastry cream. And I, I really prefer that you pipe in your pastry cream for the practice of piping. Because you, the more practice piping you can get, the better off you're going to be. So pipe in the pastry cream. You do not want the pastry cream higher than the rim of your tart or then your fruit is too high and it's going to slide off. So keep the pastry cream below the rim of your tart. And then you're going to arrange the fruit on top. You're going to glaze it with the apricot glaze. And if you want to put some fresh toasted on the on your can in the photograph, there are some toasted meds. Don't go crazy with the toasted meds. Just make it look you know, kind of pretty. They're optional. You can leave it off. If you are going to put the toasted nuts on top, then your glaze needs to be wet. Just apply. Okay. Once it sets up and sets up quickly, the nuts won't glue to it. I look hungry. <laughs> uh, okay, questions? Yes.